Hey, Peter, can you hear me? Hey, Logan, can you hear me? Hey, Joel, how are you? It's Logan Allen. Hey, how are you? Can you hear me okay? Yep, you're loud and clear. Awesome. I was just letting in Peter as well, and I'm turning on my camera as well. Can you, uh, can you see me? Yep, you're Great. coming in clear. Great, I can see you guys as well. Um, so, hey, thank you so much for making time to do this. Um, I think there's a lot of exciting things to cover today, um, I'd like to first introduce you to um, and just kind of go through a little bit of your background. And then, you know, you gave a great presentation, I think a few weeks ago, so I have it up. So maybe we can go through some of those insights and, and uh, help navigate that. And I think that'd be really great for the audience. Sounds good. That sounds great. Awesome. Um, and anything from uh, that Peter should know, uh, I know you and I spoke a while back. Yep. Anything Peter should know from just an audience and who this is going to be distributed to so we can kind of tailor our thoughts accordingly. Yeah, absolutely. It'll be a mix of family offices, other VCs, um, and other people in the tech ecosystem, um, along with people that are in late stage venture um, that are just interested about um, some of the things that we're doing. Uh, specifically, some of the family offices have had more of an interest in uh, early stage tech. Um, so I think fintech would be a great um, uh, learning. And then there is a community. I've spoken with a couple real estate family offices as well. So I know that you guys are also getting into, um, you know, well, your focus is fintech for real estate, uh, or at least one of your focuses, but then also you guys have been looking into um, another fund focusing on real estate. So some other high level insights on that uh, would be mm -hmm. great to learn about as well. For sure. That sounds great. All right. We're, yeah. we're ready to go. Yeah. Great. Let me do and, a, uh, let... nice to connect Joel. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Nice to connect. I'm glad we were able to make this work. Um, I'll just introduce you guys to the audience very briefly, and then I'll guide some questions. So we've got Logan Allen and Peter Ackerson, who are both the general partners at Finn Venture Capital. Um, super excited to learn about their story and their background. Usually what I do to kind of kick off the conversation is 
number one, learn about, you know, your origin story, you know, where did you grow up? You know, what did your parents do? Um, you know, how did you navigate your career and, and education to, um, to get into venture capital? And, you know, it would be great to kind of hear a quick snippet from, from both of you guys, and then I'll, I'll continue to moderate if that sounds good to kick it off. Sure. I'll kick off and then uh, hand it over to Peter. Um, so origin story, uh, I grew up in Europe. Uh, I was born in Frankfurt, Germany, and lived in Paris and London growing up uh, until I was a teenager. Um, my father was a corporate executive and so um, was at the behest of his, his different uh, transitions in his career and then moved to Chicago, uh, uh, went to middle school there and then high school in the Bay Area. So Bay Area is what I consider my my U.S. home, and and you know, I think uh, I've adopted it as my U.S. home generally. Um, my career was definitely not linear. Um, <laughs> I started off in management consulting, and candidly, uh, the only reason I actually got into financial services is that my first job out of Duke undergrad uh, was at Cap Gemini, and I had done an internship <laughs> at Citigroup the prior summer. Um, uh, and the Capgemini HR folks looked at that and said, great, you're going to be in our financial services division. And so, sure. um, that kicked off a career that, uh, you know, kind of persists today that focuses on the intersection of technology and, and financial services, um, was in management consulting for many years, ultimately at PwC, where I helped uh, oversee asset and wealth management consulting globally. Uh, and then ultimately, uh, went into the industry side, uh, running, uh, innovation and strategy at uh, City National Bank and then Invesco. Uh, and from Invesco, uh, I was spending all my time in the Valley meeting with VCs and, and fintech companies, trying to plug them into what we were doing uh, at the enterprise level and just got this entrepreneurial bug. And so uh, ended up joining SoFi as an early team member. Uh, and from there was an entrepreneur for many years before becoming a VC. Went back to SoFi in 2017. Uh, to launch SoFi Ventures and our corporate development office. And um, as is publicly known, the management team turned over. Uh, I ended up taking what I had built there and spinning out to form FinVC um, to really focus in on uh, FinTech, um, particularly B2B oriented companies and taking a unique approach to venture and being hands-on uh, with our entrepreneurs and, and uh, rolling up our sleeves as we like to say with them side by side. So. Um, Peter and I have known each other for over a decade, and um, he mm -hmm. came on and joined me last summer. So I'll let, let uh, uh, him introduce himself as well. Sure. Yeah, thanks. Um, so uh, Logan and I have a lot in common, actually, in terms of a background narrative in some, some specific ways. Uh, I'm originally from the East Coast, from Virginia, right, right outside of the D.C. area, uh, although I spent time living overseas in uh, Egypt and in Eastern Europe. Uh, as uh, as I was growing up, uh, because of parent uh, parent jobs, um, my uh, one of my parents was a, a attorney for the SEC who famously mm -hmm. pulled me out of school in 1987 to watch the market crash uh, and told me that uh, this was history in the making and I would never see it again. Um, so uh, instead, I've seen it now. I think every 11 years on average. So interesting. Sure. Um, moved out west after business school, went to the University of Virginia, and have spent uh, really uh, about a third of my career in investment banking focused on technology, a third in management consulting, and a third in operating roles uh, as a CFO. Uh, made the jump to the investing side uh, a few years ago at uh, Symphony AI, which is a billion dollar AI focused investment platform uh, that's really a, a carve out of Ramesh Wadwani's family office. Um, and so I worked with Ramesh and a number of other extremely talented people uh, deploying uh, large scale capital injections into early stage ventures, uh, sometimes built from scratch, sometimes uh, um, sort of invested passively. Um, made the jump to join Logan um, a couple of years ago and have been, or uh, sorry, last summer and have been rocking and rolling ever since. Yeah, it feels like a couple of years, right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, Everything no, ages in dog years right now. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so, you know, I got an interesting question for both of you guys. So from the international experiences that you guys have had, you know, growing up, that's great that you guys have had that. Um, what are some interesting just takeaways that, that you've noticed kind of growing up and the culture differences kind of growing up as a child there versus some of the differences that you see with people, you know, raising kids here? Are there any 
uh, major differences with that and maybe the education system? I'll defer to Peter on that one because my wife and I do not have kids as yet. Um, okay. But uh, just in short, you know, it was definitely a culture shock moving from Europe to the U.S., particularly on uh, the education side. Europe is far more advanced, particularly at the um, early, call it uh, preschool through to middle school. Um, and I would say even through to high school, uh, when I got to the U.S., I just felt like I was far ahead. Uh, and that was just a function of having been in a completely different school system. Um, I think uh, the other piece was just a level of, of humility. And mm -hmm. um, I guess Europe having been through a lot more than we have on a historical basis, I grew up with that sense of humility. And, and, um, and I always felt like, you know, I was being more sanguine and pessimistic and realistic than, than my peers. Uh, and maybe that stuck with me. And, and um, you know, Andy Gross always talks about the paranoid surviving. Um, I think particularly in this environment, you, you start to get some of that back um, and uh, it knocks you back a little bit in terms of how you think about the, the landscape. Sure, that's helpful. And Peter? Did he freeze for a second? I think he actually, his free, his uh, frame froze. Uh, yeah. That's okay. We'll, we'll catch up with him later when he gets back in. Yep. Um, no, but that's great. Yeah, it's interesting to see those insights. And have you, have you guys traveled back, um, you know, recently or, you know, in the last couple of years to kind of just see how the investment community has evolved, uh, you know, kind of the tech, the tech ecosystem? Have you seen kind of those um, sure. grow? And, and what are some of the sectors? You know, I know you guys focus on fintech. So um, especially in Germany, um, are you seeing kind of fintech being a larger um, place of interest or are there other, you know, sectors like consumer apps and stuff like that growing? Yeah, absolutely. So we invest globally. Um, out of our flagship fund, we invest in the U.S. and Europe primarily. So uh, I'm usually in normal times in Europe two or three times a year. Uh, sure. Where we see opportunity in fintech in Europe is is very squarely uh, in the U.K., Germany, and Switzerland. Mm -hmm. uh, those three countries, uh, in terms of what we do, which is very B2B and enterprise SaaS oriented, have by yeah. far um, you know, the strongest engineering cultures and uh, education systems for building technology companies and frankly, precedent companies where, um, you know, early founders and or employees would have spun out and started new businesses. Sure. Um, and so we think Europe from a fintech perspective is, is an incredible uh, opportunity set, um, particularly if you think about just mobility of these companies. So we've looked at insurance companies, for example, on the insure tech side. Um, there's a company called uh, Cover, Q-O-B-E-R, uh, that is providing insurance as a service. And their business has grown so tremendously quickly because um, they've been able to passport into other companies in the EU out of Belgium where they're headquartered, um, although their biggest markets uh, are, again, in, in Germany and, and moving into the UK. Um, and it, it's been interesting to watch Brexit and, and that um, knock on effect. I think that will have some really negative long term consequences for the UK, um, where I spent a lot of time growing up. And um, I think the lack of ability to start companies in the UK and then be able to quickly um, move into um, uh, the European markets is a problem. And then European companies having uh, lesser access to UK customers is, is the same scenario. So um, we invest in Europe. We look at Israel um, mm -hmm. really strong on the cyber side, increasingly on the blockchain front. Um, and then we also have a dedicated fund through a joint venture uh, in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, so it's been fascinating to look at Middle Eastern headquartered companies as part of that purview. Um, we also include Turkey and Pakistan, um, but uh, also broader Africa. And, and all of those uh, countries um, are definitely burgeoning as it relates to fintech innovation. Um, one of the things that we've done, uh, and you'll see a number of newsletters on our website, uh, finvc.co, uh, is we've created a, quite a bit of proprietary research. And, and one of those research points is around geographic evolution of fintech. And it actually follows the exact same pattern. Um, and what's amazing about fintech is that it is the foundation for all other innovation. You really can't uh, create a technology enabled business without being able to monetize it. And so 
Um, you know, at the base of the pyramid is really infrastructure and, and cloud-based technology, whether that's hybrid or true pure uh, public cloud technology and infrastructure. Um, you've got the payments uh, is, is usually first, uh, and then it goes lending, uh, wealth and asset management, uh, capital markets, blockchain, and then what we call platforms. Um, and platforms could take the form of what we call modern conglomerates, things like Grab in, in Southeast Asia, yeah. um, where they've got um, a number of core verticals, but a lot of their revenue today um, and a significant amount of their growth is being driven by fintech and financial services into those customers, whether those are drivers and sharing economy uh, type uh, participants in the app or traditional consumers and businesses. Um, and then uh, the other area that we spend are spending more time on, we're creating a JV around um, is APAC and broader China and Southeast Asia. Um, China and US are by far the two leaders as it relates to fintech innovation. Um, but we're seeing emergence in Southeast Asia broadly, um, certainly South Korea, particularly in blockchain and crypto um, and, and across that market. And as they recover more, more uh, expediently here um, from a timeline standpoint from COVID, you're going to see more of that and an acceleration of opportunity. And so uh, our view is that we're going to continue to have a flagship fund that is focused on developed markets and then very uh, specific regional funds to cover off on other opportunities throughout the world, but doing those with joint ventures with other managers um, as co-GPs, if you will, yeah. um, because we think that you need that local expertise, local um, boots on the ground, so to speak, in order to service those businesses, both from an underwriting standpoint and then ongoing from an operating value perspective. Um, so just at, at a high level, you know, FinVC focuses on, on these developed markets, on the regional markets, very much B2B oriented type companies. We don't do any consumer on our platform today, uh, nor companies that are focused strictly on SMBs. And we've had this bearish view on those two segments and business models since really 2017. Uh, and that proved prescient because those two business models are, are really uh, in significant dire straits right now in this market environment. Um, and then, you know, the other thing I'd mention is that we focus on early stage out of our funds, but have a growth and late stage uh, co-investment platform that we think is truly the future of venture capital in the sense that traditional LPs don't want to be LPs anymore, um, yeah. don't really care for fund product. And they might uh, like the exposure just from an asset allocation perspective to their satellite portfolio. Um, but by and large, they want to do direct deals and yeah. move that fee layer wherever they can have more control over liquidity, direct access to the business. In some cases, they're adding operating value and we want to facilitate that. Sure. Um, so I'll pause there. Peter, Peter's back. Um, maybe we can move, move to the next question because I think I've, I've, uh, I've addressed that one. <laughs> yeah, Peter, just to catch up, we were just talking about inter international markets and um, just some of the trends that we're seeing. Um, I got a good one too, and this is kind of still related to international. So I've been looking at a lot of deals. Some of the deals are um, international that are looking after a problem that has already been concentrated and super, um, super covered in the U.S. So one of them is kind of like a lemonade in the U.S., right? I've seen a lemonade um, somewhere in Latin America where it's just an insurance tech platform where you can easily get homeowners insurance. Um, I've also seen some of those um, auto tracking devices that help to uh, save money on car insurance if you, you know, have good driving habits. Um, that's been done here, um, but there, there are some emerging markets where that's just new and never been done before. So are there any similar trends where uh, there's a concentrated um, opportunity that's already oversubscribed in the US, but it's still quite novel and there's a lot of opportunity um, in some other countries. And if so, um, maybe just a couple high level, they could just be general. You don't have to list the company uh, if it's not public, but um, any any high level insights on those kind of trends uh, mm -hmm. would be helpful. Yeah, so it follows that geographic maturity curve I mentioned earlier and, and a, a pyramid of sorts of, of how these um, um, how these businesses, types of businesses evolve in different geos. Um, and the U.S. and China are by far the furthest ahead um, in that maturity curve. Mm -hmm. and now you're seeing the same movie play out in other regions and other countries. Um, so we call those fast followers. Um, yeah. and, um, there's certainly a lot of those. I, they tend to be consumer oriented. Sure. Um, 
But what's exciting to us uh, in that regard is they tend to be boomerang CEOs and founding mm-hmm. teams. And what I mean by boomerang is they grew up in that region, yeah. they went to the U.S. Uh, for their education and probably worked in tech for a period of time, saw what was working here, got hands-on knowledge transfer and you know, clear conviction around an idea because it was already being proved out in the U.S. or in per- perhaps in China, you're seeing the same trend line. And then they move back to their home country, whether that's in the Middle East, we've certainly seen it, um, or Africa, uh, Europe, uh, or Asia. And um, those are the types of entrepreneurs we, we love to back um, at a prior firm. Sure. I was an investor in Gojek, for example, um, two guys from Harvard that you know saw what was happening with Uber. Um, but usually there's some, there's definitively local nuance, um, mm-hmm. and there's some tailoring of that platform um, to the local culture community and, and yeah. nuance. Uh, but secondly, they usually do more with it than we have. Um, sure. So as an example, um, Gojek provided initially the Uber of Indonesia, um, but then they quickly started offering last mile logistics and delivery um, way, way ahead of uh, Uber Eats, for example. Yeah. The last mile logistics is actually in, in place of an Amazon-like or UPS DHL-like service to be able to get goods delivered to consumers and businesses, and they serve that last mile function. And then they started offering payments, GoPay, within the application so that everything that was utilized on the app um, they could pay with through, uh, through a streamlined payment service. And then they started offering insurance and so on and so on. And so I call these modern conglomerates um, that are enabled through technology and they create massive stickiness with the consumer uh, engagement and basically allow the consumer to spend their entire day inside of one app. Mm-hmm. Very similar yeah. to WeChat and what Tencent has done with that application. Um, you know, you can buy everything from you know your lunch to a mutual fund on wechat at this point um, sure so, yeah so we, we like those types of opportunities and obviously it creates greater tam larger businesses um and certainly more more stickiness in a, in a growing consumer base and that cross-sell um opportunity is is huge if you can get an initial toehold with with a consumer or business set that you're selling into being able to add additional verticals and continue to upsell that growing uh, user base is, is significant because that completely changes the CAC LTV dynamic of that business model. Mm-hmm. So, sure. We've seen it. Yep. And then when it comes to working with some of these incumbents, so I've got a buddy of mine that, um, that has created a unique model for VC where he can line up like a city bank and then line up the startups and, and the incentives are aligned for both parties because the startups get a customer and then the, you know, the city banks, the, um, the T row prices, they have pilot vendors that can maybe do things better, faster, cheaper. Um, so are you guys seeing any interesting trends internationally with working with some of those incumbents and, um, you know, finding product market fit with the, the B2B customers um, that might, that might be a potential service provider for those. And if so, what are some of the challenges with, uh, with the incumbents? Yeah, so we very much work with the incumbents. Um, mm-hmm. So a, f- a fun fact about the financial services industry is they spend about a tr- trillion dollars per year on technology, a trillion yeah. dollars. That's per gardener, and that's the largest on an order of magnitude relative to any other industry. Uh, and uh, the second uh, interesting aspect of the financial services industry is only 8% of their data is in the cloud. They're in dead last. So you've got an industry spending a trillion dollars or more per year on technology, and yet yeah. only percent of their data is in the cloud. There's a massive amount of white space and room to run for incumbents. And I yeah. would describe incumbents in really four categories. One is the traditional banks, the JP Morgans, the Bank of America of the world. Two are incumbent insurers who are very much looking to innovate. I'd say insurers have been the last ones to, to the party. Um, Third is corporates that need to utilize fintech, whether that's a, a Walmart uh, or others that uh, need to evolve their business models, both offline and online to yeah. digital payments and, and point of sale lending and insurance products and so forth. And then fourth, I'll call them legacy or, or large, uh, large fintechs. Um, so PayPal's, uh, the squares of the world and so forth. And they're all trying to find ways to innovate. And they're largely doing that by partnering with early stage fintechs and, and or acquiring them. 
And so um, there's absolutely a movement towards working with incumbents because of our B2B focus. We end up working with incumbents regularly and embrace that. Um, we have a huge number of relationships that we plug our companies into, and it's one of our value added superpowers, so to speak, in, in how we sure. work with those businesses. Um, and they welcome that opportunity because it's you know a shot on goal and, and, and an ability to bring on new customers. Um, but we think that's the next wave, and and yeah, you know, I've called it, and others have called it a recoupling, mm -hmm. um, or you know, kind of this reversion to uh, incumbents having more and more power. And, and and in the U.S. in particular, because of our regulations, fintechs are hugely disadvantaged. Um, you just see very little ability to get banking licensing and, and regulatory infrastructure, um, and so the power and the um, AUM and, and assets are certainly with a very small number of in incumbent banks and you've already seen some integration um, and consolidation in that space. And I think that's gonna continue um, as you see a pickup in M&A and so forth. Um, so yeah. yeah, I would say the incumbents are the most important part of FinTech today. Sure. You know, they still have a, a lot of work to do. <laughs> and how are the regulations internationally? Are they more strict than the US or less strict or about the same? And are there areas where there's more opportunities for fintechs to work with the incumbents because they're a little more lax. Have you seen any? Yeah. So it, it's definitively uh, less strict outside of the U.S. ex okay. China, right? Sure. So China has put in place significant regulations around even yeah. blockchain development, peer-to-peer um, -peer lending, and a number of other areas, and that's mm -hmm. a result of, in some cases, under-regulating initially and then seeing significant fraud and pyramid schemes and so forth, and then completely reverting back and, and um, outlawing those types of business models. And I think they're finding a happy medium um, and there's still incredible innovation coming out of China. Um, I would say the U.S. is, is heavily, heavily regulated uh, and in this administration has, has not done much to, to open that up um, yeah. and versus Europe where you have incredible open banking laws, um, uh, sandboxes within uh, local banks and, and federal sure. uh, government facilities. Uh, Singapore, another great example, um, incredible uh, support for early stage ecosystems in the form of funding and capital, incentives for VCs to set up uh, offices there and, and operate in Singapore. Um, and then the Middle East, um, it, I was in Saudi, uh, in October, and they've done an incredible job setting up a sandbox and, and opening up uh, uh, digital banking and API technology to new startups. So encouraging that innovation starts with government and then integration of public private sectors um, in order to, to shore up that, that growth curve. Um, and the U.S. is, you know, largely just been relying on the private sector to make that happen. Sure. And that's fine. But um, at, the, at the same time, there just hasn't been enough opening up in, in the right way um, to give access to fintechs to make them truly competitive with with the incumbent landscape mm -hmm. and that for us is one of the primary reasons at least for our u.s investments that we spend so much time on b2b and enterprise software so we're we're not going to fight that trend we're going to work with it and yeah I think that's to to our advantage long term sure and then as far as getting more things on the cloud because i mean you you shared that stat that was pretty Pretty eye-opening. Uh, what needs to happen to kind of innovate and just isolate those problems to get more things in the cloud? And mm -hmm. um, what what do you think the benchmark should be in the next five to ten years? You know, how much do we need to get onto the cloud to really support all the key workflows and and really really get the um, the modernization initiatives out there for the mm -hmm. incumbents? Yeah. So you know, eight, eight percent of the data is in the cloud today. Mm -hmm. Those are mostly hybrid clouds. Yeah. Um, combination of on-prem and and pu public cloud usage. Sure. Uh, actually, one of the main issues, believe it or not, is that legacy banks have massive mainframe technologies um, and they have a significant amount of data and functionality living inside of those mainframes. Mm -hmm. And being able to migrate that data and functionality to the cloud actually turns out to be a pretty significant technical problem. That's, that's, sure. the, first, that's the first issue. Yeah. The second issue is just internal privacy uh, controls and data management, data use controls. And for some of those, those are, you know, regulatory issues and others are just internal policy um, and needing to figure out a way to find a happy medium using things like master data management, data lakes, data warehouses, et cetera, um, to migrate that data to the cloud. 
Um, and I think the, the advantage, the third piece is the advantage of having that data in the cloud. It's not only getting more use from a data analytics, AI machine learning, et cetera, perspective out of that data, but also being able to leverage it to use APIs and new integration frameworks to mm -hmm. Um, partner with some of these enterprise software companies that are going to do big things at the front end. If you bring it back all the way back to the customer experience and then the front end user experience, whether that's a, a loan officer or a, a financial advisor, um, that data uh, does them no good sitting inside of a mainframe yeah. uh, somewhere in, you know, in a large warehouse. Uh, they really want to have it at their fingertips and they want to be able to mm -hmm. utilize it in increasingly um, incredible ways using modern front end SaaS based technology. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, those are the key challenges. It, it's, it's a global issue. It's across financial services. Um, but financial services is in dead last as it relates to solving for this problem. And um, it's a combination of all those three factors that I just mentioned. Sure. And with addressing the legacy issues with the mainframe technology, uh, what, what would need to happen to help to uh, move it to a format that's usable? Would they have to migrate it to a standard database or can they just, you know, create some type of APIs or is there like a physical process that, that needs to happen to actually take that data and convert it into a yeah. new format to consume? It's a, true, it's a true lift and shift today, usually yeah. involving hundreds of management consultants. Yeah, and, sure. And there is very, we're actually looking actively and are interested in talking to companies that are working mm -hmm. on this from a technical perspective, yeah. including a data funnel, so to speak, to migrate um, that data and translate it from what's most likely COBOL <laughs> yeah, uh, sure. in, into new modern uh, uh, programming languages. Um, but by and large, just taking the raw data uh, and understanding what the functionality uh, of that uh, data was, was intended mm -hmm. for uh, and migrating it. And that's, that's a really tough technical problem, as it turns yeah. out a few companies working on it. Um, again, I think hybrid cloud for financial services is going to be likely the, the trend line. Um, and uh, we're ho hopeful to continue, you know, finding uh, uh, innovation in that space. But it's been very slow moving, as any uh, bank CTO will tell you. Sure. And I guess with those manual services that the, um, that the consultants are doing, are there any things that they do that could be automated? Or is it right now with the lift and shift still, still, only done by manual processes. I guess, are there any really, opportunities? Uh, yeah, it's Excel CSV dumps yeah. and kind of flat file formatting uh, to migrate that data. Uh, Got it. That's pretty much the, the norm at this point. And sure. if you talk to Amazon Web Services, AWS and um, Azure and, and these other uh, cloud providers, they'll yeah. tell you they have tools and automation. Sure. Um, but that usually is is then picking up a phone and calling IBM or Accenture. I mean, it's it's pretty yeah. unbelievable. And so I think we'll get there over time. But mm -hmm. every single one of these banks has a, a unique legacy tech stack, um, again, with legacy code bases, mostly proprietary development. Yeah. They've all had massive mergers and acquisitions over the course of their history. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's like Groundhog Day with every new backend system that you have to unlock and understand exactly how it foots. But many of them are relying on that system for their day-to-day -day businesses, yeah. uh, particularly their core banking systems uh, and uh, their lending systems um, are massively legacy uh, and, you know, not built for, for this type of scalability. Sure. And what are some other workflows maybe in the back office? I mean, are there any opportunities uh, like in the you know QA automation space or just kind of back end data management that could be automated that you've seen? And are there any interesting companies that you think are, are doing that stuff that you're excited about? Um, I would say uh, blockchain. So uh, we view blockchain as an enterprise application in and of itself. Yeah. Uh, facilitating uh, certain use cases to make them cheaper, faster, better. And sure. one of our best uh, performing investments and largest companies is Figure. Uh, and Figure has built a blockchain protocol for uh, a number of different use cases, starting with facilitating asset-backed securitizations on blockchain. Mm -hmm. And in the traditional capital markets, a securitization process will take on average 120 days and costs roughly 150 to 200 basis points to an originator. So if I'm Bank of America and I'm um, originating 100 million 
uh, mortgages and I want to securitize those mortgages. It's a, it's a hugely onerous, sure. um, highly manual process today involving a number of expensive and intermediaries. Um, Figure has put that process on blockchain and taken the process down to very short term, if not same day, uh, and around 25 basis points. And so uh, those are the types of use cases that we think blockchain creates an incredibly powerful solution for. And many of them are boring back office uh, functions um, yeah. that traditionally have not been addressed by uh, startups and technology. Um, the other use case figure is building out relates to fund administration. Um, the fund mm -hmm. admins are ancient and they're building on very legacy technology uh, and, and charging in incredible fees. Um, whereas it's a simple portfolio accounting exercise uh, that can be easily facilitated by blockchain. And that's something that figures launching now as well. So we think the biggest transformation in FinTech and financial services as it relates to back office, but certainly parts of the middle and the front office is going to be driven by adoption uh, of blockchain. And that's sure. both by traditional incumbents and then fintechs use, utilizing it in a novel and unique way mm -hmm. um, where you have a number of expensive intermediaries and, and, and truly legacy processes. I'll, I'll let Peter touch on that one as well because I'm sure, sure he has thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think uh, Logan's spot on there. Um, you know, there's, there's a number of explicit savings and opportunities. I think there's also what's overlooked in terms of future potential is some of the implicit things that are under the hood of those transformations, specifically uh, the acceleration of the digitization of these products uh, via blockchain and otherwise mm -hmm. to make information flow and so much more accessible uh, eliminates the need for a number of rent takers. When you think about custody, when you think about uh, you know uh, verifying um, sort of chain of ownership and these types of things, um, and then more generally, when you think about risk management, understanding at a granular level everything that goes into an asset-backed vehicle, for instance, or to look at a different context that's outside of blockchain in in a lot of ways, but may end up there. Um, when you look at a high uh, frequency API different transactions and the ability to do instantaneous KYC, mm -hmm. AML, um, anti-fraud, uh, and those things at scale and at speed uh, because of the nature of uh, the, the data that is now available, yeah. you get to a place where you start having conversations around not just, hey, this is a way to make legacy processes better, but actually, you know, you look at companies like Plaid, Marketa, all of these guys that yep. are API forward, they have deconstructed the value chain and the operations chain and then reassembled it in a way that allows fundamentally different types of business activities. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a, a company that we're working closely with right now recently tell us when we asked about customer attrition, he said, we've never lost a customer because our, none of the companies that use us could fundamentally do what they do without us. Sure. Um, you know, They've built the entire business on top of our technology yeah. framework. Um, and that's really, you know, as an investor, that's obviously what you want to hear. Um, but more generally, it speaks to the rollover industry wide between traditional, you know, tech stacks that are kind of geologic in their age, but also in layers upon layers that have been fused together under pressure over 50 years. Uh, and then what these guys can come through when they start with a first principles approach to innovation, um, yeah. I think is really pretty incredible. Sure. And let's talk about first principles approach. You know what, can you, you know, for the audience here, can you unpack that a little bit? And um, how can someone have a good first principles approach when kind of looking at deals and opportunities? Um, I think, you know, the way we approach it is mm -hmm. we first start uh, with a development of theses. Yep. Um, you know, so for our first fund that we had a very clear set of these are sort of eight or nine things and you mm -hmm. sort of you want to forward project and then retroactively mentally build backwards which is yeah what is the macro trend that's going to take place over the next five to ten to fifteen years what does that imply about the things that need to come in between and that's when you do sort of then your look at who's in the ecosystem who's building mm -hmm. um who's well positioned and i think you know the thing that's interesting about fintech particularly early stage where we sit is there is always a ton of activity but you have a, an industry that is huge in scale 
um, global in scale in a lot of ways, heavily regulated. So you have to understand that context for early stage. Yeah. Uh, dominated by um, sort of behemoths. Mm -hmm. So you have to understand from day one, how are you going to fit into the ecosystem? How are you going to add value to your competitors? Sure. Because you may be, we have a number of companies where the figure is, you know, adjacent to or competitive potentially with some of the securitization activity, mm -hmm. but highly beneficial to the asset and wealth management sides of, of larger banks. And so you have these very complex strategic landscapes uh, that are typified by, you know, for lack of a better word, frenemies. Yeah. Um, and you, you kind of need to know how to think about that from day one. Um, and so we think about that in the context of what our theses are. And then a lot of it is from there, you know, spade work. Um, you're, sure. you're calling out uh, to a number of people. Um, and from a first principles perspective, you know, what's interesting about this particular moment in time is the first question is, is sort of an existential one. Do I think this business will be around in 12 to 18 months? Mm -hmm. Because we're here to support growth. We're not here. Uh, you know, primarily as lifeboats, you know, yeah. so you have to have that filter up front. Um, and then, you know, there's a number of other things that we're always attuned to, yeah. um, you know, who, who is experienced. That's obviously not a, a defining, but it's, you know, people who have experienced in this space, who's doing something novel. There's a lot of copycat sure. business models and in general, they're not successful. Um, and, you know, who is doing something that is, an order of magnitude better. Uh, and often that comes from having deconstructed and rethought from, from top to bottom a specific area. Sure, that was really helpful. Thanks for elaborating on that. Um, so we got around 20 minutes. So Logan, Peter, what I was thinking to do is pull up your presentation and um, I can just navigate it and uh, maybe you guys can speak to some of that. And then um, at the end, what I'll do is I'll have you guys share a couple pieces of advice, personal, professional from mentors. And um, that'll take us to the top of the hour. So how's that sound? Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. Great. Let me pull that up. And then you just tell me where to move and I'll just kind of click over. So this is kind of the intro page. So you kind of give a presentation at a, at a family office summit um, and I'll let you take it away. I just tell sure. me where you want me to switch. Um, yeah. And so we, I, I presented this uh, presentation uh, through an interview uh, with the Family Wealth Reports uh, editor, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and you'll see on our website uh, in the news section, the video presentation of that, uh, if you care to learn more. Um, you know, I think we can click through uh, to uh, probably slide four, um, just defining fintech verticals. So uh, there's a lot of noise on what's in and what's out uh, as it relates to fintech. We take a fairly broad diversified view um, because if you're going to be a specialist uh, in venture capital, um, having some degree of diversification is, is important from an investment return profile standpoint. Um, so we, we define it as nine uh, subsectors, and we really play across all nine of these subsectors. Um, and relative to geography, where we see the most white space and opportunity, as, as Peter talked about, we define um, uh, subsector theses that we think are truly investable and are, are going to generate the next generation of companies that are solving for very specific problems. Um, so I won't go into all these in depth, but this gives you a sense for the universe that we cover. Uh, and it's pretty broad, sure. uh, not as broad as our friends on the generalist side of the world in venture, but um, certainly quite a bit of expertise that's required to delve into any of these areas uh, that we've built over the course of our careers. Um, so we can go to the next slide. So uh, why are we investing in fintech and, and why now? Um, we talked about most of this already, but um, you know, between the demographics and customer expectations shifting, uh, the rise of, of new fintechs that are supporting uh, incumbent models, uh, regulators and frontier techs being able to open up the ecosystem I would say it's mostly frontier tech that's doing that and enabling that. Um, and you know, you're seeing a significant amount of consolidation. And so uh, we don't believe that incumbents having been corporate executives um, can really innovate from within. It's extraordinarily difficult. 
And so as a result, you've seen a significant amount of consolidation and M&A or this recoupling trend that, that I referenced earlier. Mm -hmm. So Intuit acquiring Credit Karma, Visa acquiring Plaid, uh, Morgan Stanley acquiring Solium and E-Trade, Goldman acquiring Clarity Money several years ago, and then seeing significant activity um, out of groups like Viserv and FIS acquiring WorldPay and First Data, uh, and then SS and C uh, acquiring Intralinks and a number of other businesses. So we think this trend of consolidation and um, recoupling is is going to continue, uh, and that's going to be a ma major driver of exits for uh, the fintech world. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, so this gives you a sense for where the activity lies, and this is this is a little data at this point. There's been a, an update uh, in in 4Q, um, but you know approximately 58 fintech unicorns valued at over 213 billion, and this shows the story that fintech is a global phenomenon, and uh, you have an opportunity to invest in these fintech businesses across the board. Um, and there are some geographic nuances, but they largely follow a very similar trend line. Uh, and that gives us an opportunity uh, when we're working in new markets to be advantaged because we've seen a number of these businesses and how they've worked and played out uh, in, uh, in the US. Um, so we can go to the next slide. So this is the ecosystem uh, uh, kind of I'll call it maturity curve that I referenced earlier. Yeah. So geographic patterns have been highly aligned across the board. And so if you're living um, in Southeast Asia, for example, you're at really this lending uh, set of the pyramid moving into PFM, which is personal financial management tools, starting to see some roots in insurance. Um, mm -hmm. But you have a very degree of, I'll call it fill in across all these different buckets um, in terms of how much you've developed and, and the level of maturity in each. Uh, and what's important is that, as I mentioned earlier, fintech uh, really forms the basis of everything else from a tech growth perspective, e-commerce, sharing economy, delivery and last mile, um, uh, semi-autonomous and autonomous transportation, point of sale, healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. If you don't have payments, lending, insurance, facilitation, and so forth, you're not going to have other tech-enabled businesses. Um, sure. which is why we think fintech is such an important area to be investing in as an early mm -hmm. stage investor, but also from yeah. a government support standpoint. That's great. And this is more aligned with if you're a family office, how should you be thinking about accessing and allocating to VC? You'll see uh, in our on our website, in our last newsletter, we talked to a report that Cambridge produced that recommends a 20% allocation to venture capital for family offices. And while that might sound high, Yale is at 22%. Uh, that's just VC. Uh, sure. What's amazing about that is Yale has completely outperformed all of the other IVs for the last decade. And so, you know, it's an interesting, uh, interesting signaler. And we think Cambridge is leading the way as it relates to asset allocation in this space and, and providing input to, to family offices and other institutional investors. Um, the other interesting aspect of venture is that you're seeing this huge intergenerational wealth transfer to the millennial and Gen Zers. And so what that's created is significant interest in technology. And as a result, you're seeing more family offices where the Gen 2, Gen 3 um, uh, principals are getting involved in the asset allocation and that's going to draw them more towards what they're familiar with and what they know and get excited about. Um, and our recommendation is that you start with fund of funds allocation and that gets you access. It gets you exposure to the asset class in your satellite portfolio construction, gets you all the benefits that I, that I'll refer to below, um, from a correlation perspective, access to alpha, uh, and, and really access to the growth that you're seeing in the return profile, private markets versus public markets. Um, sure. And then start migrating to direct manager allocations and over time co-investment. I think most family offices that we work with and talk to certainly indicate that they would love access to co-investment and we provide that mm -hmm. for them. Yeah. Um, but when it comes down to reality of actually moving quickly on those co-investments and being able to underwrite it, even with a sponsor like ourselves, it creates some challenges. And so just being yeah. realistic about that, um, really truly setting a risk appetite and, and having family planning and meetings um, as a family office and setting those expectations and 
really drawing the line of, of where you'll invest from a risk appetite perspective and, and where you simply won't. Um, so that's how we think about venture. And, and then I think sure. the next slide is just um, some best practices and thinking about manager selection and, and, and allocation. So mm -hmm. um, venture very much follows a J curve and power law return profile, meaning a small percentage of the companies in a venture fund are ultimately going to be the ones that drive the majority of the returns. You're actually seeing, whenever I talk to family offices about venture, they say, oh, well, it's, there's too much of a risk profile there. Well, actually, there's been diminishing loss ratios and a lower risk profile um, really since the 90s. Um, so in the late 90s, uh, around the dot-com uh, bubble burst, uh, loss ratios were over 50%. Um, but as you've seen ecosystem growth and maturity incubators and more hands-on operating approaches like ours, you're actually closer to 20%, which is very sure. much the ballpark of a growth or buyout fund. So venture is not massively more risky and there's a lot you can do to mitigate that risk mm -hmm. and get comfortable. Early stage funds is where you wanna be. Um, growth, late and mixed stage funds across cycles have underperformed, um, particularly in markets like this, it's extremely difficult. Um, and early stage has been able to outperform for over 30 years. Uh, smaller funds outperform. We think there's going to be a reversion to the mean where you have these multi-billion dollar funds. I think uh, Andreessen's already shown this. They've started to create uh, subset funds of their overall flagship fund that are specialist in orientation. And that's point five, which is that specialists are truly outperforming generalists in a significant way um, as our emerging managers. Um, and then lastly, global diversification, uh, benefits, correlation, and risk metrics. I think that's fairly well proven across other asset classes. And then lastly, co-investment rights can be meaningful to more predictable alpha, given those power law return dynamics. If you can get direct access to a, the leading performing company in a given venture yeah. portfolio without uh, a fee layer or with a reduced fee, fee layer, that could drive more predictable alpha in the portfolio. So I think those are all the points I wanted to make in the presentation. Sure. Uh, Happy to happy to wrap up with some advice. I think, you know, uh, actually, well, let me touch on the last slide. If you go two more slides down, and this is the advice I'll, I'll use. Mm -hmm. One more. Yes. So for family offices, uh, technology is is more important to adopt than ever. And so, you know, our advice is that you look at fintech, but you look at this part of the Venn diagram that's focused on family office uh, technology. And there is a whole industry uh, uh, focused on the space. Now, granted, some of these systems are utilized by traditional RIAs, wealth managers, and asset managers, um, but many of them cater directly to single and multifamily offices, which is you know, a significant portion of this audience. Um, so when you're thinking about that and you think about the functions of a family office from CRM to cybersecurity to governance to uh, multi-asset class management, portfolio management, performance reporting, accounting, et cetera, um, there are individual systems for each of these. So, you know, as the next generation takes over the family office, as you need to drive efficiencies, stay on top of market, changing market conditions, and just be organized as, as a family office function, um, these are some key systems. One of my favorites is Way to Be One. Um, Way to Be One, it, it was built out of Sergey Brin's family office to help enable uh, decision making and to remove bottlenecks um, from family office uh, participants. So, if he was relied upon to make a decision, whether that was you know, saying yes to a real estate investment to buying a plane, um, you know, it was a very significant uh, process and a lot of email and a lot of phone calls. And Way to Be One basically created a workflow platform to facilitating that. Second company I would point to is Solovis. Um, they just got acquired by NASDAQ um, for your client reporting challenges. Uh, I think Solovis sure. is one of the best in the industry um, and has outpaced private wealth systems and Adapar and others in terms of the functionality and robustness they bring to the table. Sure. So those are my takeaways. Uh, and uh, it's been great uh, getting to have this conversation. I'll turn it over to Peter for, for his uh, takeaways to close it out. Yeah, be great. Yeah, I, um, I, I think it's, it's interesting and we have this conversation pretty frequently. I mm -hmm. think um, one of the things that is sort of lost is sort of the operation side. So those technology platforms, I think can be tremendously powerful and people yeah. forget. And that goes for us, that goes for a lot of people. You think, oh, I just get the right companies and then I cut a check and like, that's, that's really what the job is. Um, and that's, you know, obviously an important part of the job, but there's an awful lot else that goes into it in terms of portfolio construction and thoughtfulness. Yeah. I think, you know, particularly in times like now, um, you know, but, but with FinTech, what we're seeing broadly, um, I'll go back to the advice that I got 
you know, growing up in Virginia, I, I kayaked a lot and rode the river a lot uh, in a variety of places. And Logan and I are both big sailors uh, out mm -hmm. here in San Francisco. Um, and, you know, one of the things you need to understand is you need to understand how to read the water and you need to understand uh, what, you know, how your boat handles. Sure. Um, and there's an awful lot of, uh, I think, investment strategies, particularly in this environment, that were set up as sort of crew skulls that were lean and moved very, very fast. And that's great when you're on flat straightaways. Um, and then yeah. you get into the rapids and all of a sudden they don't work very well. Sure. Um, and you need a kayak, which may be a little bit less efficient, but is a lot more agile and robust. And we're, we sit deeply in the world of, of sort of uncertainty and, uh, and the fusion of, and balance of strategy and tactics is uh, pretty integrated. So you don't really have these conversations with early stage companies because uh, as a practical matter, uh, the, you know, professionals uh, in this context don't talk strategy, they talk logistics because logistics is the strategy. What sure. can you execute against? It's not anybody can paint a high level picture of, mm -hmm. you know, the, what we should be doing is going after this market segment or, you know, we have a billion dollar TAM and you're like, no, there is a billion dollar TAM. You have no customers. Sure. Um, so what's your execution strategy? I think yeah. that level of discipline and critical thinking is more essential now um, and to have a very clear insight in you know what the environment is in the spaces you're investing into getting exposure to what your appetite and capabilities are and that will drive whether you should be doing you know have your allocation into funds or direct investing or sectors or managers and how you want to think about those types of things yeah um, i think that's always um, taking a, t a step back and, and sort of reflecting on that is, is always a, a significant value add. Yeah. One more piece I think would be helpful because you guys are probably going through this now, you know, and I'm dealing with this. There's late stage opportunities um, that are interesting to families, but some of these families are non-technical. They have done real estate and land development. So I spend a lot of my time doing education um, on how the tech ecosystem works. What's your advice and your experience on just kind of navigating technology and education to non-technical um, families? Mm -hmm. Is there a different layer of education that you have to add on to kind of the stuff that you're presenting now um, to kind of cater that, that knowledge transfer? Sure, yeah, so I would say three, three things. One is there is definitely a huge set of opportunities in the secondary space in late stage private equity at this mm -hmm. point. That's kind of our version of the distressed world, although yeah. many of them I would call more value-oriented plays um, where there's a earlier investor on the cap table and um, they want to sell and there's some opportunity for cap table cleanup. And we do those types of things all the time. Sure. Um, we've done four of those deals historically in just Great. the last 18 months and we're seeing a huge pickup in that activity. Uh, number two um, would be uh, working with uh, professionals and GPs uh, as an LP uh, or, or, or as a sponsor. Uh, and so really looking for high quality VC names and um, expertise on the cap table um, in advance of investing into these late stage businesses, connecting with them or getting brought to the table um, by a VC you're already invested with and you trust and there's significantly aligned interest versus just a brokerage fee or the like, which, which can be very, really problematic and creates a misalignment. Um, and then three, um, absolutely, I think the continuing education opportunities in MIT, um, Harvard, Duke, Stanford, all these schools have online programming mm -hmm. and it's never too late uh, to get an understanding, at least for the basics of, of yeah. technology and know just enough to be able to ask smart questions when you are talking to these management teams or evaluating a deal. Um, and I think moreover, um, related to technology, certainly is understanding uh, the, the core tech stack of that business and why it's different and what the moats are. Um, but number two is getting your arms around more traditional factors like valuation mm -hmm. and, and uh, contribution margins and gross profit and so forth, which I think most you know, savvy real estate family offices and others understand fully well. Sure. Um, and don't um, simply ignore those um, because you know, there's a lot of bells and whistles on the technology. I think people get lost in that a little bit. Yeah. Um, Fundamentals still definitely matter now more than ever. So really Absolutely. appreciate you putting this together, Joel. And thank you for taking the time here with the FinVC team.
Yeah, thank you. Thanks for thanks for all your time. And this is really great. Um, I, I'm very confident the audience will just really love all this content and get a lot of value. So thanks for your time and uh, have a great rest of the week. Take care. Thanks, Joel. Take care, Bye, guys. You too. Thank you, Joel. Yeah. See you guys. Bye.